What happens when a country's institutions are controlled by one man? What happens if Erdogan loses the election? What happens if Erdogan refuses to step down? What happens when you try to remove a strong man from power? That's what the Turkish people are up against. In a historic election pitting longtime leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan against opposition leader Kemal Kilicdaroğlu, Turks have the chance to choose their destiny. Who will win? Could the elections be rigged? What happens if Erdogan loses? And can Erdogan be removed from power? Find out in this video. Under Erdogan, Turkey has locked up more journalists than China, a country 16 times larger. If you want to overcome censorship and have free access to any media you want, consider signing up for ExpressVPN. With ExpressVPN, you can change your location and get unrestricted access to any news and media from anywhere in the world, including Turkey. So if you want to help out the channel and avoid censorship, as well as getting three months extra of ExpressVPN for free, go to expressvpn.com slash my take. Link in the description. Back to the video. People versus Nation After 20 years in power, for the first time, Erdogan is in danger of being ousted. He faces not only a united opposition, but a massive economic crisis and the devastation of the earthquake. Turkey's election is a showdown between two men supported by two coalitions. On one side, you have the People Alliance backing Erdogan, composed of four parties. The conservative Islamist AKP of Erdogan, the secular far-right ultra-nationalist MHP, and two minor Islamist parties. On the other side, you have the Nation Alliance supporting Kemal Kilicdaroğlu, composed of six united opposition parties, the center-left secular CHP, which is the party of Ataturk, the center-right nationalist Good Party, and four minor center-right parties, including two parties founded by Erdogan's ex-foreign minister and Erdogan's ex-economy minister. The one major party not included in any of these coalitions is the left-wing pro-Kurdish HDP, which is Turkey's third largest party. Instead, the HDP is part of a minor left-wing coalition called the Labour and Freedom Alliance, but this alliance has not fielded any presidential candidate and the HDP has endorsed Kilic Darolu for president. So what are the chances that this united opposition can defeat Erdogan? Currently, polls show a neck-and-neck -neck race. For the presidential election, Kilic Darolu has a slight lead with 46.2% compared to Erdogan's 42.6%, with the rest going to minor candidates. This means that the election will go to a runoff. While Kilic Darolu has consistently been beating Erdogan in every poll, his margin is slim. For the parliamentary elections, Erdogan's People Alliance is slightly leading with about 40% of the vote compared to 38% for the Nation Alliance. Looking at the individual parties, the AKP remains the biggest at 32%, the CHP at 28% and the HDP at 10%. This means that while Erdogan's People Alliance and the AKP will remain the biggest faction in parliament, Erdogan will likely lose his majority. All this means that Turkey's election is essentially a toss-up. It did not have to be this close. Kilic Darolu is not the most popular candidate that the opposition Nation Alliance could have put forward. Kilic Darolu has been CHP party leader since 2010 and has lost four parliamentary and two municipal elections to Erdogan in that time. By contrast, the mayor of Ankara, Mansur Yavash, also from the CHP, polled at 60%. The popular mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem Imamoğlu, also from the CHP, polled at 51%. Both these men are more popular and charismatic than Kilic Darolu. But Kilic Darolu is the party establishment and has the necessary political ties. While Imamoglu was barred from running due to trumped-up charges placed against him by Erdogan for insulting the Supreme Electoral Council. But ultimately, this election will be about Erdogan's management of the country. Erdogan's Legacy as we speak, inflation in Turkey is at 43%. The Turkish lira has lost 450% of its value over the last five years, and vast swaths of the country have been devastated by the earthquake, in large part due to the mismanagement of the government. Under these conditions, no ruling party should win an election. But to understand this election, we have to understand how Turkish people view these crises and evaluate Erdogan's legacy. Because Erdogan's legacy is not black and white. One could argue that 
Erdogan was one of Turkey's best leaders, but also one of Turkey's most dangerous leaders. That Erdogan built Turkey's modern economy and that he's currently destroying it. When Erdogan first came to power in 2003, Turkey was facing even higher inflation rates than today, as high as 53%. Within a short time, inflation was brought down to 7% and Erdogan set the path for a decade of rapid economic growth, including large-scale infrastructure projects, massive increases in home ownership, and a revamping of the healthcare system. It's because of this economic recovery, as well as Erdogan's Islamic and foreign policy credentials, that he became so popular in the first place, winning over a dozen elections. But he exploited that popularity to consolidate power, gradually undermining Turkey's institutions from the inside out including the military, the courts, the media, and civil society. He cracked down on the Gezi Park protests in 2013, and in 2017, he secured the power to rule by decree after a controversial referendum in which several opposition leaders were arrested and media coverage was massively skewed. This authoritarian turn meant that there was no one to stand in the way when Erdogan began implementing economically illiterate policy. When Turkey's currency went down in 2018, instead of raising interest rates to prevent further inflation, Erdogan instead lowered interest rates and fired any central bank governor who didn't go along. All this did was worsen inflation, which peaked at 85% in October 2022. For the majority of Turks, 56%, the economy is the most important issue in this election. And if Erdogan cannot demonstrate an improvement in the situation, it will hurt him in the election. Now, to Erdogan's benefit, inflation has been coming down since October, now sitting at 43%, but this is still one of the highest inflation rates in the world and the highest in Turkey in 20 years. And then, there's the earthquake. On February 6, a massive earthquake hit Turkey, killing more than 50,000 people and displacing more than 5.9 million people across southern Turkey and northern Syria. While the earthquake is not man-made, it was made a lot worse by structural policy failures. Back in 1999, when Turkey had its last major earthquake, New building code regulations and an earthquake solidarity tax were introduced to prepare for the next earthquake. But despite having 20 years to prepare, Erdogan's government did not properly enforce these regulations. And in 2018, Erdogan granted blanket amnesty to building owners who did not adhere to the building codes, allowing them to get away with just a small fine and leaving more than 6 million buildings not up to code. As for the 88 billion lira, or 4.6 billion collected by the earthquake solidarity tax, the money disappeared. Add on to that a delayed earthquake response, and it's clear that many deaths could have been prevented with better leadership. But do Turks think that way? Polls show that 45% believe that Erdogan is better placed to deliver earthquake recovery, while 43.4% have more faith in Kilis Darolu. In other words, Turkish people's views of the earthquake response are just as divided as their politics and mostly determined by political affiliation. But there is another way in which the earthquake could affect the election. Most of the regions affected by the earthquake were AKP strongholds. At least one million voters in these earthquake-stricken regions will not be able to vote due to mass displacement and destruction of their homes, which in a twist of irony could undermine Erdogan's vote share. With a united opposition, an economy in crisis, and part of the country in ruins, things don't look good for Erdogan. Under these conditions, in a free and fair election, you would expect the opposition to win. But all this assumes that the election will actually be fair. Illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy and electoral autocracy are two terms that describe a country that is somewhere in the middle between a full democracy and a full dictatorship. In these countries, while regular competitive elections are held and it is theoretically possible for the opposition to win, the deck is stacked so much against them that it becomes nearly impossible without massive swings in public opinion. Turkey is one such case. 
Even before Erdogan, Turkey was not a full democracy. After all, the military regularly intervened in Turkish politics whenever it felt that elected leaders veered away from Turkey's secular republican principles. But when Erdogan came to power, he took successive steps to undermine Turkish democracy, taking over Turkey's institutions from the inside out, including the military, the courts, the media, and civil society. I have a video that goes into much more depth on what that entailed, so make sure you check that out. The point is that while elections in Turkey are free in the sense that there are multiple parties and the results are a reflection of what people voted for, they are not fair because everything around the election is designed to make it harder for the opposition to win. Take the media for example. Over the last 20 years, Erdogan charged independent media outlets with politically motivated charges and then had them bought up by pro-AKP businessmen. The result? 90% of the Turkish media is now under Erdogan's control. So instead of discussing the government's responsibility for the earthquake or Turkey's faltering economy, the media is focusing on Erdogan's achievements while providing negative coverage of Kiliç Darolu. Censorship is also widespread. Turkey has arrested more journalists than China and people are regularly arrested for criticizing Erdogan in public or on social media. But even with skewed TV coverage, at least on social media, alternative voices could be heard more often. That is, until 2022, when Erdogan signed a law criminalizing disinformation on social media. Of course, what constitutes disinformation is worded vaguely enough that the law can be used as a blanket instrument of censorship. Then there's the courts. Erdogan has packed Turkey's courts with Erdogan loyalists. Those same courts ensured that Erdogan's most popular opponent, Istanbul Mayor Ekrem Imamoglu was barred from running and sentenced to three years in jail. The charges? Insulting the Supreme Electoral Council after Imamoglu called them stupid for cancelling his mayoral election victory in 2019, which he went on to win with an even bigger victory in the rerun election. They did the same thing to Selahattin Demirtas, the leader of Turkey's third largest party, the pro-Kurdish HDP. In the 2015 elections, a surge in support for the HDP denied Erdogan the supermajority he needed to change the constitution. So in 2016, Demirtas was jailed on terrorism charges for alleged links to the PKK, a Kurdish terrorist organization. And now those same Erdogan appointed judges are pursuing a case to outright ban the HDP. On top of that, before the election, Erdogan changed the way seats in parliament are distributed in such a way that would give the AKP an advantage. In other words, under the old system, the AKP was unlikely to win a majority this year. But Erdogan changed Turkey's electoral law just before the election to ensure that his party can win an extra 10 to 20 seats, enough to win a parliamentary majority. As for the elections themselves, until now, Erdogan has largely refrained from outright rigging, but there have been attempts. Back in 2014, when it looked like the AKP candidate was going to lose the mayoral election in Ankara, the live reporting of the vote counting mysteriously stopped for several hours. Once the live stream restarted, the AKP candidate was suddenly in the lead. Similarly, in 2017, during the constitutional referendum, Erdogan appointed judges declared on the day of the referendum that unstamped ballots were to be accepted as valid, making the vote vulnerable to electoral fraud. In both these cases, we don't know what really happened. But while the voting process itself might still be fair, those votes are cast in an environment where opposition leaders are jailed, the media is controlled, censorship is widespread, and dirty tactics are used to undermine the opposition. But it's not just what happens before the election that we should be worried about, it's what happens after. What happens if Erdogan loses? Republic on the brink. In all likelihood, this election is going to go to a runoff. But Erdogan has a few tricks up his sleeve to ensure he stays in power regardless. The first is chaos. Back in June 2015, when the AKP lost its majority in parliament, instead of negotiating to form a coalition government, Erdogan ended the government's two-year truce with the PKK, a violent Kurdish separatist organization designated as terrorists in Turkey, the EU and the United States. Over the following months, 
as an all-out war against the PKK ensued. Chaos engulfed the country as dozens of terrorist attacks ravaged the nation from both the PKK and ISIS. Erdogan's pitch was simple. It's me or chaos. Either the electorate would return his party to power and allow Erdogan to restore order, or the country would collapse into violence. And it worked. During snap elections in November 2015, the AKP regained its majority. Erdogan could try something similar in the time between the first round and the runoff, weaponizing extremist violence to stay in power. You see, one of the parties which endorsed Erdogan is Hudapar, a hardline Kurdish Islamist party with links to Turkish Hezbollah. This extremist party has less than 1% support but has a history of Islamist violence. On the other extreme, you have the PKK. In a bid to sow chaos, Erdogan could encourage violent clashes between Hudapar and the PKK and tell the electorate that this is what awaits them if they choose the opposition. It would also help to split the opposition nation alliance. You see, Kilic Darolu is supported both by the center-right Turkish nationalist Good Party and the left-wing pro-Kurdish HDP. But if violence from Kurdish extremists fills the streets between now and the second round, it could create a split between opposition Turkish nationalists and pro-Kurdish forces, delivering victory to Erdogan. But even if this doesn't work, there's also what happens after the election. Even if Erdogan loses fair and square, he will not accept defeat. His own interior minister, Suleyman Soylu, said that if Erdogan lost, it would be a coup attempt by the West. That doesn't sound like someone who's going to go out peacefully. In March 2019, when Ekrem Imamoglu won the mayoral election in Istanbul by a razor-thin margin of 48.8% to the AKP's 48.6%, Erdogan declared that the election was invalid and had the Supreme Electoral Council nullify the result. However, when the election was rerun in June, Imamoglu won by an even bigger margin, with 54% to the AKP's 45%. This shows that when faced with defeat, Erdogan, like Trump, will try to nullify the results of the election. Unlike Trump, however, he actually has the institutional power to get it done. And unlike in 2019, the stakes are much higher. Because this time, Erdogan's own job is on the line. The only thing that can overcome this is an overwhelming electoral victory for the opposition. If the election is even remotely close, we should expect Erdogan to try and overturn the results. Right now, Turkey is massively polarized. Half the country fervently supports Erdogan and half the country fervently hates him. If one side believes that the elections have been rigged, it could lead to violence in the streets. This is why the opposition has to outperform not only to overcome the institutional barriers against them, but to remove all doubt in their victory. If the opposition succeeds, and it really is an if, Turkey will become a shining example of how to remove a strong man in a semi-authoritarian, illiberal democracy. It would be one of the first major countries to reverse the democratic decline that is taking place across the world. The Nation Alliance is a broad and ideologically diverse coalition, but they have all agreed on a few basic points. That Turkey needs to return to a parliamentary system to prevent power being concentrated in one man ever again, and that the independence of its institutions should be restored. They also have a plan to end Turkey's massive inflation, raising interest rates and paving the way for the restoration of Turkish prosperity. If Erdogan wins, Turkey will only continue down its path toward full authoritarianism where elections begin to matter less and less and all opposition is merely symbolic. But if he is defeated, Turkey has the chance to build a real model Middle Eastern democracy. How did Erdogan come to power and undermine Turkish democracy? Find out in my previous video. Don't forget to get ExpressVPN and get three months extra free. Consider becoming a Patreon to support the channel. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Thank you to my patrons including Linda, Richard and many more for making this video possible. Like, share and subscribe. Because this was my take.